la weá se cortó, weón. Seco, weón, maricón. Fuck you, motherfucker. <ríe> se cortó, culiao. Eh, se cortó, si sí, estaba en problema. ¿Quién quiere ir a la policía, culiao? ¿Quién ir a la policía? <ríe> Están borrachos, culiao. <ríe> Fucking hell, my. Mira lo que está pasando con Chito Madre. Chupa el pico. Tú mataste el pico. Le, eh, 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 le cagaste, weón. No, 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 le dieron, le dieron la... Victoria Vita, ¿cómo era? Victoria Vita era la weá, mierda. Sí que están encerrados los culiados, a ver, tengo que hacer un café o algo. Bueno, la weá. Hay que comer algo, tengo que comer algo, soy culiado, soy culiado. Tengo que comer algo, a ver. Este. Y voy, no sé qué estoy haciendo, no sé qué estoy haciendo, pero estoy haciendo un sándwich, weón culiao, fucking dickhead. Oh. Estoy botando, estoy botando, estoy botando. Oh, se le así, mire, weón, mire, mire, mire. Así como se le da la wea. La wea. <coughs> Aprieta la concha de su madre. Eso, hijo de puta, estoy comiendo esa weá por chicha. Chía, oye, 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 padre de Chile, vaya Santiago Chile, Sebastián Piñera, ole, ole, yo, 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 lo amo más, lo amo más, lo amo más, Chile, Sebastián Piñera. Que come el sándwich, weón. Mmm. Está muy mal a cortar la weá, que Dios nos ama, weón. Es un sándwich de vuelta, vean.
se acuerden, remember, a Dios, a God. A ver, a ver. No, y el equipo, culiao. <risa> Tres. A loose one. <clears throat> name of God, name of God, man. I love you. Be sporty, sporting, <laughs> sporting. Good evening, everyone. The science and grim projections that just weeks ago brought this country together against a common enemy are under fire tonight, along with a doctor who has helped lead the fight against coronavirus. President Trump tonight rejecting Dr. Anthony Fauci's dire warnings against reopening the country too soon. The president late today suggesting schools could reopen soon, even as we learn kids may be at more risk from COVID than previously thought. While Fauci himself, who has predicted many more Americans will die, came under a broad attack. And that's where our reporting begins with Jeff Bennett. President Trump tonight slamming the stark warning from Dr. Anthony Fauci against reopening the country too soon. Look, he wants to play all sides of the equation. I was surprised by his answer, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it's just, to me, it's not an acceptable answer, especially when it comes to schools. During Tuesday's Senate hearing, Dr. Fauci was asked whether colleges and schools could feel safe welcoming students back in the fall. He said that would largely depend on the availability of testing. Fauci's call for caution clashing with the president's push to lift restrictions, fueling growing fatigue among some Republicans. I think it's very important that we not let any one person dictate what we do in the economy. It comes as yet another top government health official is set to deliver a different dire warning to Congress about the coronavirus crisis. Ousted vaccine expert Dr. Rick Bright set to tell a House committee tomorrow that the U.S. faces the darkest winter in modern history if it does not develop a more coordinated national response to the pandemic. Dr. Bright filed a whistleblower complaint last week, alleging that he was forced from his job for opposing the wide use of unproven coronavirus treatments embraced by President Trump. His comments coinciding with new reporting from the Associated Press about the CDC's reopening guidance, which was shelved by the White House. The AP reporting that the recommendations were much more detailed than previously known, offering states specific guidance on when communities should allow for non-essential travel and recommendations on when to shut down again in the event of future flare-ups of the virus. 
The White House said the document had not been cleared by CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield. Those are guidelines in draft form that a rogue employee has given you. But the AP reports that internal emails show that Redfield did sign off and repeatedly asked the White House to approve the release beginning more than a month ago. Meantime, word tonight that the rapid coronavirus test from Abbott Laboratories, which the White House uses to test the president and those around him, may miss as many as half of positive cases. That's according to a new report from NYU Langone Health. The company is disputing the findings, saying the outcomes in this paper are inconsistent with any experience that we've had with this instrument. The FDA telling NBC News the agency is reviewing the NYU report. And tonight, former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort has been released from a federal prison due to coronavirus concerns and will continue serving his sentence for tax and bank fraud and home confinement, although there are no known cases of coronavirus at the prison where Manafort was held. Lester? All right, Jeff Bennett, thank you. And as the battle rages over schools, even between the president and his own top medical advisor, there's news about that mysterious inflammatory syndrome striking children. It's now in at least 17 states. Kristen Dahlgren has the latest. In Oregon, a state with one of the fewest numbers of coronavirus cases, 14-year-old Leah Lopez didn't know what to think when she developed red eyes, a fever, and searing abdominal pain. On a scale of 1 to 10, it was probably like a 10. By the time she got to the hospital, she was in fairly severe cardiac failure. Leah didn't know anyone with COVID-19, had been careful herself, and is now one of a growing number of kids with pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome. She tested positive for COVID antibodies. What it makes us realize is that it can happen to any child at any time, and we need to be prepared as cases surged today to more than 80 in New York City alone, the mayor announced a new ad campaign to alert parents. While the governor said New York is now prioritizing tests for children showing symptoms of the inflammatory syndrome. If your child has been exposed to someone who had COVID, even if it was several weeks ago, uh, that is a special alert in this situation. Three children have died and the syndrome is now suspected in 17 states. It's still rare, but experts have shifted their thinking about kids and coronavirus. Coronavirus isn't a benign condition in kids. We need to figure out what that denominator is, how many kids actually had coronavirus. By tomorrow, the CDC is expected to issue a national alert to doctors to look out for symptoms, including prolonged fever, rash, red eyes and abdominal pain. Most children seem to respond to treatment. In New York State, more than half have now gone home, including Jaden Hardawar, who got a warrior send-off. But tonight, their stories may be a warning for what other children could face in the weeks ahead. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. Tonight, another big-name school is announcing that some in-person classes are already canceled for the fall, and many parents and young people are left wondering What's going to happen to their schools? Here's Gabe Gutierrez. Tonight, Harvard University is telling its new medical, dental, and graduate students that classes will be online this fall after the nation's largest public university system, Cal State, called off in-person classes at its 23 campuses. Across the country, higher education is now facing a reckoning. It's confronting not only the, the challenges that the virus presents, but broader issues about things like affordability. Still, a new poll shows 65% of college students say they would attend in-person classes this fall if given the option. 31% say they would only attend virtually. That means despite the risk, even with potentially packed lecture halls, students clearly prefer a more traditional in-person college experience, not a virtual one. Annie Colson is a theater student at NYU. It is so important for me to be face to face with all my teachers and my peers because we're all learning off of each other and we learn so much more in person. As of now, the vast majority of colleges, 70 percent, are planning to resume in-person classes this fall, though life on campus will likely look very different. Pace University in New York is still grappling with the decision. What we're looking at is changing the way we live, we work, and we play and study. Also at stake, money. Nationwide, 345 private colleges and universities are at risk of closing or merging over the next several years. And this year, fewer high school seniors have applied for college financial aid. A sign coronavirus may disrupt enrollment.
Lila Robinson from Ohio is a psychology major at McGill University, which will only hold online classes this fall. She's devastated. Just anxious because you don't know how long this is going to last and what's going to happen. A senior year unlike anything she ever expected. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, New York. From beaches in California to stores in Ohio, more of the country reopened today, even as cases are still climbing in some areas and tempers are flaring. Here's Miguel Almaguer. As more of the nation reopens today, there is caution, confusion, and concern. In states like Arizona, pools, spas, and gyms got back to business with restrictions. So thrilled and excited. In Ohio, more retailers were back on the job, while in Oklahoma, they're rolling the dice on gambling, reopening casinos. We're taking temperatures at the door. We've limited the amount of guests that can come into the facility. But some worry the push to make money comes at the cost of public health. As restrictions are being lifted, new hotspots with significant spikes in coronavirus cases are emerging in the heartland. The staggered reopening of the nation sparking dueling protests to both speed up and slow down the push to get Americans back to work. In Fresno, California, a city councilman cited for misdemeanor battery after this confrontation with protesters on his porch. In Los Angeles, the concert season is canceled at the famed Hollywood Bowl for the first time in nearly a century. This is 25 miles of coastline reopened to the public today with new rules. I was a little bit nervous, but I'm glad we did it. With LA's most iconic industry shut down and no plans to start production anytime soon, some are ready to begin filming elsewhere. In Georgia, where there's also a mixed bag of restrictions, Tyler Perry Studios will reopen for production in July, testing and sequestering cast and crew for the filming of two shows. But tonight across most of the country, the script is unwritten over reopening as more drama plays out. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. Tonight, the FBI is warning that China is jeopardizing the development of a vaccine by trying to hack American research. Richard Engel has more. China is trying to steal U.S. coronavirus research, the FBI announced today, by hacking scientists and companies, including those working on a vaccine. That warning, also coming from the government's top cybersecurity agency, says China's potential theft of this information jeopardizes the delivery of secure, effective, and efficient treatment options. American secrets aren't the only targets. The UK, where Oxford researchers say they hope to have a vaccine ready by September, is also seeing attempted hacks. I had a rare interview with the head of the cybersecurity division of GCHQ, the British equivalent of the NSA. They're attacking different targets. So the nation states are moving away from perhaps things like energy companies towards strategic health care targets, towards university researchers into COVID vaccines. The Trump administration is singling out China, specifically by name. You are not going there. You're not saying China per se. The UK and the US share a common picture, a common assessment of the threat. China is not the only nation accused of cyber espionage. Iran reportedly tried to hack into the company that makes the drug Remdesivir, which was granted emergency authorization for COVID by the FDA. Tonight, US authorities are advising healthcare companies to beef up their defenses against hacking. China and Iran deny the allegations. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrives for a day of top-level meetings. The first Israeli soldier killed in action this year is laid to rest amidst a devastating ceremony, and the discovery of a 70-year-old mural in Jerusalem leads to a nationwide manhunt.
Today's news, fear has gripped central Israel after a man armed with a knife stabbed a security guard outside of the Sheba Medical Center in the city of Ramat Gan, just outside of Tel Aviv. The attack reportedly occurred outside the entrance to the maternity ward at the hospital, and the guard who was stabbed, a man in his 20s, is suffering from light stab wounds. As for the suspect, the security guard who was stabbed managed to shoot the attacker back, and Magen David Adom paramedics have since declared him dead. Finally, though, police are still investigating this attack. As of now, it's reported that the suspect arrived for a psychological exam and pulled a knife only after being ordered to wear a face mask before entering the hospital building. Now, meanwhile, United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has arrived in Israel this morning for an historic day-long visit. Addressing the press before noon, just moments after landing in Israel, United States Secretary of State Pompeo and Prime Minister Netanyahu discussed plans to talk about the coronavirus, Iranian threats to the region, and of course, the United States' Middle East peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. Now we're about to form uh, a national unity government uh, tomorrow. Uh, I, um, I think that this is an opportunity to uh, promote peace and security based on the understandings that I reached with uh, President Trump in my uh, last visit in Washington in January. Uh, and these are all tremendous challenges and opportunities. And we can do them because we have such a, uh, such a powerful bond. We'll get a chance to, to talk about the vision for peace. We're now some months on uh, from the day that you came to Washington when President Trump announced that vision for peace when you were there. Uh, there remains work yet to do, and we need to make progress on that. I'm looking forward to it. All that said, Pompeo has fallen short of giving any approvals of Israel's planned annexations within Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. And in the past, the Secretary of State has suggested that it's Israel's decision in the end, but that the government shouldn't rush into extending its sovereignty just yet. Meanwhile, Pompeo's visit in Israel will only last a few short hours before his return flight to Washington, and his and his entourage's itinerary will be strictly controlled. His meetings will include sit-downs with both Prime Minister Netanyahu and co-Prime Minister slash Defense Minister Benny Gantz. As for American officials, Pompeo and his team and the Israelis set to meet them have all been undergoing regular testing and checkups in the days leading up to this trip. And United States Ambassador David Friedman has backed out of the meetings at the last moment over reports of respiratory issues, though he is testing negative for COVID-19. And now joining us with more on the implications of the first diplomatic visit to Israel since the outbreak of COVID-19, we have the president of the Jerusalem Washington Center, Gideon Israel. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, why was it important for the United States Secretary of State to come to Israel now? And what are the main goals of this meeting? Well, this is the first time that Israel has a government in more than, more than a year. And there are a few important uh, topics on the agenda to, to discuss. One... One is, of course, the, the Trump peace plan and how it will unfold in the next few months. Will, will Israel apply sovereignty over uh, certain areas of Judea and Samaria? Um, another, another issue is obviously to speak about um, Iran's aggression in the region. And there's, of course, um, the coronavirus and how Israel's combated it and how America has and what uh, information they can share together, specifically on uh, vaccines. And the other thing is uh, the future of China policy. Um, China is a major trade partner for Israel, but um, it seems if the Trump administration already took a different policy than previous presidents towards China, um, the coronavirus and the disinformation on, on, on behalf of the of coming from uh, the Chinese Communist Party has only caused more um, suspicion of China. So. As, as, as the United States goes forward, um, I think they want to coordinate um, what the policy will be with China because um, Israel has a lot of technology that China is after. And I think they want to make sure that certain technology does not get to China. Well, so that's actually what I wanted to ask you about, you know, because the United States is now asking Israel to withdraw from several economic partnerships and agreements with China. Uh, you know, can Israel abide by these requests and and should or will Israel abide by them? Well, there's no there's no question that um, Israel's main ally in the world is is the United States, and it's a strong alliance because it's bottom up. There's strong public support for the alliance, and they don't have that anywhere else in the world. So Israel Israel, I think, needs to uh, take into consideration 
um, some of the worries of the United States, especially when the United States views these as, as national security issues, and especially um, if these issues will impact um, United States partnership with Israel. Remember, the Trump administration, as opposed to maybe other administrations who saw Israel as um, a problem in the Middle East and, and the peace process as, as the main issue, the Trump administration sees Israel as, as a partner. Mike Pompeo, in his speech to AIPAC, said that the more the Middle East embraces Israel, the brighter their future will be. He said that five times. So I think it's important for um, Mike Pompeo to, to coordinate um, what the policy will be um, Israel and China uh, going forward. All right, now let's move on and, and talk a little bit about the United States peace plan you just brought up. Now, do the Americans actually think that, that this plan has a real chance of, of working as opposed to the previous plans? Because, you know, a lot of analysts are saying it's basically dead on arrival. Well, the United, the United States has put forth what they believe is a different approach to, um, to peace in the Middle East, and I think it's what they believe is a... Uh, fair approach. So um, they, they're putting forth this approach not only in order for it to work, but in order to uh, set a new course for how to approach the, uh, the conflict in the Middle East. And what, and what about plans to annex parts of the Jordan Valley and, and in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank? Because you know, some say that it would mean the end of peace with the Palestinians and possibly even with Jordan. Do you agree? Well, people have been forecasting the end of um, peace for a long time. People forecasted um, dire uh, um, things that would happen if uh, if the United States moved its embassy to uh, to Jerusalem, and uh, so and and that didn't uh, come to fruition. So I think uh, I think we'll really have to wait and see. Remember, for for Jordan to just end its peace uh, with Israel or even to embark on a new course, it, it has to be able to mobilize its people, and that's not a, that's not such a simple thing to do. So. I think we'll, we'll have to wait and see. All right, Gideon Israel, thank you again. As always, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, tragedy has struck in Israel as family, friends, community members, and government officials all gathered in the town of Be'er Yaakov for the burial of IDF soldier Amit Benigal. The nation is in mourning. Hundreds of crying faces were seen peppering the crowd Tuesday at the funeral of Israeli Defense Forces soldier Staff Sergeant Amit Benigal. As of now, the 21-year-old soldier from the Golani Combat Unit is the only Israeli soldier to be killed in action this year. Defense Minister Neftali Bennett addressed Benigal's unit, pushing them to catch the wicked person who killed him and ultimately, quote, defeat Israel's enemies. His parents eulogize him as a hero worthy of admiration, though crying out for him to guard them from above. In the Israeli army, only children need special permission to serve in combat units like Golani. And Amit was his father's only child, with two younger half-sisters on his mother's side. But at Amit's request, his father Baruch signed the permission papers. Amit felt it was an honor to serve in the Golani Brigades, even penning his feelings on Facebook for last year's Memorial Day. He wrote, To be a Golanchik is to hear Hatikva, the national anthem, and get chills in every part of your body. I, Amit Ben Igal, am proud to be a Golanchik. Proud to take part in the long-standing tradition like Golani proud to be the continuation of many drafts before and to be a role model to those after. Well, Ben Igal was killed Tuesday morning during a raid in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank when a Palestinian resident dropped a half meter or one and a half foot stone atop his head from a rooftop above. And IDF soldiers have since re-entered the area several times in search of the suspect who killed him. Upwards of 10 people have since been detained for connection to the incident. Fresh clashes between residents and the IDF have also sparked, however, in response to their re-entry, which included armored bulldozers and heavy engineering vehicles. Now about 20 Palestinians have been arrested throughout the West Bank amidst searches Wednesday for the suspect who killed Staff Sergeant Amit Benigal. And the IDF believes that three terrorists were on the roof when one dropped the death-dealing stone. But to get a closer glimpse into the life of an Israeli soldier operating in the West Bank, we're joined by former Knesset member and IDF lieutenant colonel in the reserves, Yoni Shetbun. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, 
Let's Thank start you. with with what Benny Gal and his Golani unit were doing Tuesday morning at the time of the incident. You know, why does the IDF enter the West Bank villages at night, and how often do they do this? Yeah, it's important to understand that every day, every night, there are IDF forces entering towns, villages in Judea and Samaria in order to stop terrorists and actually prevent the next terror attack in the heart of Israel. Yabed, the village where uh, that the uh, event fortunately was yesterday, is very is near to Jenin, a city that there are there there are all the terrorist organizations like Fatah, Hamas, and Jihad. All right, and and again, you know, is is that a typical location then? You know, for for the IDF to enter, are they are they in Yabed a lot? Yeah, yeah Yabed it's uh, very, it's near to Jenin in the north of Judea and Samaria. At the last, in the last two decades, at the end of every military mission, there are stones, furniture, Molotov cocktails are thrown uh, at the IDF soldiers in order to kill. This is the word, in order to kill soldiers, uh, Israeli soldiers. This is a typical uh, operation. What we have to understand that at, in the end, at the end of every mission, there are stones who thrown, are thrown at the IDF soldiers. Now, I understand that this is not really the first time that an IDF soldier uh, ha has been killed in this way. What does the IDF maybe do to prevent soldiers from being hit like this? Or is there anything that really they could do? Mm -hmm. Just two years ago, there was a, a soldiers from a, the van unit was killed the same in the same way that mm -hmm. Amit killed yesterday. He, uh, in order to prevent the next event, the state of Israel, the IDF, should take steps in two ways. Uh, first is the uh, first is changing. Consider to consider changing the opening fire instruction again. Stone is killing. Second is deterrence. Uh, we have to consider a curfew. Every uh, Arab, uh, every citizen who live in uh, a village, a village like that, like Yabed, curfew does not allow uh, allow you to walk in Israel or to sell goods. This is one. This is an example for for uh, deterrence. Is that something that Israel can really enforce? My, my final question: Is that something that Israel can really enforce? This is a policy. It's uh, the uh, people and the politician and the senior uh, the senior uh, officer in the IDF have to make this decision to change the method of the fire opening instruction in Judea and Samaria. At the same time, to empower the deterrence in the villages in the town, all the Judean Samaria. And the IDF, as an officer in the army, as a lieutenant colonel in the army, the IDF does, the soldiers of the IDF are doing, are doing a good job in Judea and Samaria, but we have to prevent the next event. All right. Well, of course, our, our hearts go out to the family and friends of Staff Sergeant Benny Gal. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, now another two victims to the COVID-19 pandemic brings the total Israeli death toll up to 260 by Wednesday morning, and 23 new cases have been confirmed, raising active infection numbers to 4,186, while 12,000 have now recovered. But as the Lagba Omer holiday comes to a close, fresh fears of a second outbreak are rising. Thousands of ultra-Orthodox worshippers have been continuing to ignore virus restrictions on crowd sizes, taking to the streets across the country to light traditional bonfires and breaking into a sacred tomb compound at Mount Meron. Footage reportedly from the site even shows a number of Orthodox men breaking down the door to the tomb, and more than 300 Haredi men were arrested there when riots later erupted with police attempting to split the crowds. <laughs> Now, 
ואז נאלצנו לתגבר פה בכוחות את המקום ולפזר את האנשים ולבצע מעצרים. As of this morning, however, 317 people arrested overnight at the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai on Mount Meron have been released. Three suspects are still under arrest, however, for assaulting police officers. On a related note, coronavirus restrictions are still easing every day, and in the coming weeks, international flights between Israel and select other countries is also set to begin. But how will the airlines deal under the post-coronavirus regulations? And will there even be much of a demand? Here to answer is Gil Stav, the Vice President of Marketing and Sales at Israel. Now, how has the pandemic affected Israel specifically? How many employees are on leave or were let go? And how many are likely to return in the coming weeks? Israel is an airline who suffered from the corona situation. Um, right now, around uh, 60, 65 percent of our employees are uh, not working. Um, we already extended they released until the 31st of August. That means that we are optimists that there will be flights again, but not so soon. Wow. Well, and, and I understand that, yeah, by the end of May, your company will at least start flying back to a small number of destinations. What, what is the plan to return to activity, and which countries are you flying to? Okay. Right now, we are doing basically uh, mostly uh, rescue flights. We believe that in the beginning of June, we'll start some sort of a pilot, maybe to fly to close destinations such as uh, Cyprus um, or Greece. Um, we think that the sky will start to be opened at the uh, beginning of uh, July. Um, we're going to concentrate first on safe countries that, uh, of course, we know or Israel knows that there is no uh, uh, COVID-19 in them or it's a good situation. But we are talking about uh, military agreements between countries because the first problem that we need to solve is a self-guarantee for 14 days for the people that are coming from aboard. Hmm. All right, so you know, speaking of health, how are you going to maintain passenger health while they're on board and, and traveling with you? Because you know, I even heard a rumor that there will no longer be any in-flight meals. Is that true? Yeah, basically we are um, cleaning the, the aircraft um, all the time. Um, we won't serve any food at the beginning. All the passengers will have to uh, wear masks during the whole flight. Uh, so this is what we'll do to keep uh, the health of our passengers. And we are flying for short distance uh, destinations. So you won't be stuck in an aircraft for uh, 9, 10, 8 hours. Well, most of the time it will be up until one hour or three hours at all. Now, the hotel industry in Israel has also suffered severe damages. What cooperations do you have with them? You know, what kind of deals can tourists maybe take advantage of? Well, we are building packages with the hotel here in Israel uh, to Eilat. Um, one of the packages of the package is uh, to buy a flight ticket plus a hotel in a very low price. Um, we are doing also a cooperation with a mall the ice mall in Elat, um, whoever uh, buy um, at, the, at the mall itself, go and buy their about uh, 1,000 shekels, he will get his flight uh, ticket back. Wow. That's incredible. All right. Well, you know, I'm sure that I speak for everybody when I say we can't wait to, to start getting back into the air. Hopefully it'll be sooner than later. Gil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Turning now to politics, Israel's 35th Knesset is set to be inaugurated tomorrow, finally bringing an end to a year-and-a-half-long election cycle. And the 36 ministerial positions newly created by this coming unity government are starting to fill up fast. With just 24 hours left before Israel's emergency unity coalition takes the reins, Blue and White Party leader and co-Prime Minister-elect Benny Gantz has now officially resigned as Knesset Speaker. In the coming rotational government, he'll instead serve as active defense minister until October 2021, while simultaneously holding the title of co-prime minister. Though Gantz is also rumored to be taking on an assistant defense minister to help in the post. As for Gantz's replacement as Knesset speaker, Likud MK Yariv Levin will be taking over as planned, while Yuli Edelstein has finally agreed to take on the health ministry. 
This after the health portfolio was abandoned by both Health Minister Yaakov Litzman and Director General Moshe Bar Simontov. Berelstein had been Knesset speaker for seven years before Benny Gantz, and until now he'd been threatening to leave the coalition completely if he wasn't returned to the post. But the Blue and White Party has rejected his return, and it seems his bluff has been called. Meanwhile, several other Likud MKs are also getting the shuffle. Foreign Minister Israel Katz will become Finance Minister. Justice Minister Amir Ohana will likely become Public Security Minister. Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan is going to be the new United States and UN Ambassador. And Culture Minister Miri Regev will likely become Transportation Minister. Ultra-Orthodox Party Chiefs Yaakov Litzman and Arya Deri then will be Construction and Housing Minister and Interior Minister, respectively. Finally, though, Gantz has yet to announce his ministerial assignments. He'll have final say, however, over several coveted portfolios, including the defense portfolio, the one of foreign affairs, media, culture, justice, and sport. And he's also set to publish his appointments at the last moments before inauguration. In other news, an incredible mural has just been discovered in Jerusalem, bringing new life and shedding new light on the 1948 War of Independence. ILTV's Nittany Manson has the story. An amazing 70-year-old artwork has now been unearthed, and the mural had only been revealed when a wall collapsed during construction work near a commercial center in Jerusalem. Now, this mural is made to look like the front page of a newspaper that was published in Israel from 1943 until 1995. And in the captions, there are images of IDF forces climbing a fortress and a sinking Arab weapons ship off the Italian coast. But where did it come from? Well, it seems to have been painted by a soldier who took part in the 1948 War of Independence, specifically the battles for Al-Kastal and in the village of Kalunia, just west of Jerusalem. And the whole mural will be safely removed to storage until a heritage center is finished, at which point the mural will be returned for permanent display. As for the artist's personal identity, a nationwide manhunt for the soldier has started, with the Council of Conservation of Heritage Sites calling on any Israelis with information to come forward. Now for our final story tonight, we turn to the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, just outside the Jaffa Gate, where Israelis are expressing solidarity with Jewish communities in the diaspora who have disproportionately been hurt by the coronavirus pandemic. Jewish and especially ultra-Orthodox communities around the world have seen some of the worst coronavirus infection rates per capita. So in a show of unity and support, the walls of the old city of Jerusalem were, were lit with the flags of the nations where these diaspora populations reside, like in the United States, France, and the UK. And speaking at the event, Diaspora Affairs Minister Tsipi Otoveli reiterates that Jewish communities have stood beside Israel during war and terror and celebrated with us during times of triumph. So today, we stand with you. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. You can expect a warm but partly cloudy evening with lows around 67 Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow will be warm and partly cloudy again, but with a high of about 90 or 32 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Love the innovations born of <laughs> born of necessity. This is the best newest way to hug amidst the coronavirus. <laughs> I gotta take that over to my grandmother's house now. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.52 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.
inpatient shopper pulled out a gun at a Publix deli. Orlando police releasing this video showing the man who was wearing a mask and gloves pull a gun from his pants on Saturday. Now, he didn't shoot anyone and no one was hurt, thankfully, but panicked workers and shoppers were seen running from the store. A witness said the gunman was complaining on how long service was taking. Where's the album? We want the album. Where is the album? We need the damn album. Where is the album? We need the damn album. Where is the album? Release the damn 